There we go. All right. Uh, does it look fine, everything? Can it looks fine that? to me, yeah. Awesome. OK. Yeah, so as mentioned, I'll be talking about Heiger, Steiner, triple systems. And I should mention before I begin that everything um, that I'll talk about here is joint work with Matthew Kwan, who's at ISD Austria, and Tom Sani, who's a fellow graduate student at MIT, and Michael Simkin uh, from Harvard, who I think is actually in the audience right now. So feel free to chip in if I say anything potentially misleading. OK. So just to start off, um, let's just recall a couple of uh, basic notions. So first of all, a Steiner triple system, uh, there are a couple ways to interpret it, but the way that we'll think about primarily is thinking of it as a decomposition of the complete graph into edge disjoint triangles, uh, such that every edge is in exactly one triangle. So you can already sort of see that n choose two edges need to be split up into groups of three. So n choose two needs to be divisible by three. Um, and perhaps a little less obviously, but it's a pretty standard observation, uh, is that since every triangle has degrees two, two, and two, if I look at a single vertex, it has n minus one edges coming out of it. And every triangle will cover two, or I guess zero, of those edges. And so two has to divide n minus one. And so there are sort of these obvious divisibility constraints that are required basically by looking at some set of vertices and looking at their co-degree outwards and has to be divisible by something nice. Uh, so in this case, you look at one vertex or, or zero vertices and you look at the total link. So, okay, so if we put these two things together, we see that n has to be one or three on six. And Kirkman showed a, a very long time ago, actually, uh, this you could argue is one of the first very purely combinatorial statements, uh, other than like work of Euler and other such things. But um, actually, a very long time ago, Kirkman already was able to construct these Steiner triple systems for all such valid n, which is not a priori obvious that you could actually do this. Um, even when n equals seven, you should convince yourself that you can do this. Um, this is you get something called the Fano plane as sort of a basic example. Great. So perhaps more generally, uh, you could look at uh, designs. So another way of thinking about what the Steiner triple system is doing is we have n elements and we're taking sets of size three and we take some collection of sets of size three such that every set of size two is containing exactly one set of size three. So you can sort of convince yourself this is the exact same thing as this graph terminology. And more generally, you could ask, well, if you give me some Q and some R, where Q is, a, Q is let's say, greater than R, I want a collection of sets of size Q such that every set of size R is contained exactly once. So this is called an NQR design. So for example, if Q is four and R is two, this looks at decomposing Kn into K4s. Or if R is three, then it looks like decomposing a three, reg, uh, a three uniform hypergraph in some way and, and so on and so forth. Okay. So we aren't gonna talk very much about this general problem, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention this groundbreaking work. Um, so, Namely, that as long as n is large, and again, you have to satisfy these obvious divisibility constraints, then NQR designs do exist. And this is uh, originally proven by Kibosh um, and reproven by Glock, Kuhn, Lowe, and Ostas. So here's maybe just an explicit statement for reference um, while I continue talking. So just to be very explicit, as long as we have these sorts of specific divisibility constraints coming from basically all of the possible degrees or like shared degrees in a hypergraph, um, and we look at the complete uh, hypergraph basically, then we have these NQR designs that exist as long as n is large enough. And the large enough just comes from because we're doing all these sorts of asymptotic and combinatorial methods um, alongside this, this construction. It's really not an explicit construction in any way, shape, or form. In fact, once R is like at least seven or something, six or seven, nobody has an explicit construction. Um, so yeah, groundbreaking work. 
And I should mention that Kivash uses this technique that uh, he calls al randomized algebraic constructions. And this interplay has been seen in many other areas as well and been used for many other sorts of construction problems and other such things. And Glock, Kuhn, Lowe, and Ossis use a uh, more purely combinatorial technique um, called iterative absorption, which uh, they introduce, uh, they adapt for this problem, but was perhaps first introduced in different settings by Knox, Kuhn, and Ossis, as well as Kuhn and Ossis for uh, Hamilton decompositions. They decompose the graphs into a bunch of Hamilton cycles, regular graphs or otherwise. There's a lot of work about that, but we don't really talk much about that. Um, we'll mostly focus on the use of iterative absorption for constructing designs. And specifically, we're going to be looking, of course, at standard triple systems and, of course, trying to make them, quote unquote, higher. Um, for various reasons that I might mention a bit later, um, it turns out that iterative absorption will be more amenable to the sorts of things that we'll want to do later. Um, and, and part of the purpose of this talk is actually to sort of elucidate on some of the key ideas of iterative absorption and hopefully give an idea of um, why it's powerful and what sorts of things we need to do in order to um, understand this high girth problem. All right, are there any questions about just this initial setup um, before we start talking about more specifics? All right, so um, there are many ways to actually motivate uh, the problem that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, one that I'll mention is uh, due to this connection with the brown air shush problem. So this is um, a very old problem in terms of understanding hypergraphs. Uh, you look at a three uniform hypergraph, let's say, and we want to look at such uh, hypergraphs where no J vertices span at least L triangles. And if we have N vertices, let's say total, then F N J L is the maximum number of edges in such a configuration. So you can sort of think of this as a hypergraph version of, you know, looking at the largest, you know, triangle free graph or whatever free graph. Although here, it turns out that in hypergraphs, these things are already much more difficult than in graphs. And so even this restricted problem where we say, okay, let's just say forbid a certain number of edges on a certain number of vertices and leave it at that. That already is quite hard, as we'll see. So as the most famous example, potentially, the 6-3 theorem of Ruja and Samaretti is that f of n 6-3 is little o of n squared. And this actually almost directly implies Roth's theorem about uh, sets avoiding three-term arithmetic progressions. So this is not an easy result and their original proof uses basically the triangle removal lemma. Um, and so the original proof goes through this Semrendi's regularity lemma essentially. On the other hand, there are some, one could say relatively simpler cases, although the arguments aren't trivial by any means. Um, Brown, Erdős, and Shosh, when they introduced this problem, actually showed that f of n, j, j minus 2 is of order exactly n squared, um, although the constants are, are not known in general. Um, and OK, and actually, let's say, simple case is f n, 4, 2. So let's just quickly actually uh, draw this out. So what is f n, 4, 2? So we have four vertices. And we have two hyper edges on them. So here's basically what it has to look like. We have two edges that share a single, uh, if two hyper edges would share a single two edge. Uh, and we need to avoid this. So how do we avoid this? Well, this is actually basically the same condition as being a, a Steiner triple system or, or like a partial Steiner triple system because every two edge or every set of size two is an exactly, or at most one set of size three. Um, and therefore Fn for two has to be at most one third of n choose two because every triangle will take up three, three of the two edges. And this equality would be achieved precisely by a standard triple system. 
uh, okay, if n isn't divisible by the right things, then maybe you're off by like five or something, but even Kirkman could already show something like that, I think. So in this case, fn for two, you can actually say it's exactly, you can say what it is exactly. So Erdish conjectured um, that in some sense, this avoiding this 4-2 configuration is really the hardest thing um, in this regime of J, J minus 2, at least. Um, and I guess, I'm not sure exactly what he personally was thinking when making this conjecture, although there are a couple of ways in which you can interpret this that, that are quite natural. Um, but just to give a precise statement to begin with, um, the conjecture is that there, for every admissible value of n, there is a Steiner triple system, so com complete triangle decomposition of the complete graph, which has no j j minus u configuration for any j up to some up to some bounded amount. Let's say we fix some g and we force all j between four and g, and and we avoid all such configurations. So just stated another way, you could say that the 4-2 problem is therefore the most restrictive condition in some natural sense. So first of all, uh, why is it hard? So uh, one might recall uh, that standard triple systems can be viewed as a hypergraph matching problem, uh, where you view uh, what you do is, let's say we have a, let's say we have a graph, right? We have all of its edges. And what we do is we create a new graph where the vertices are the edges. And the three edges are triangles. So you can sort of think of like dualizing this configuration or something where basically each of these circles is now a vertex and this triangle is a hyper edge between these three vertices. And in this way, we have a hypergraph where we have n choose two vertices corresponding to the original edges and certain, certain special triples, which correspond to uh, the triangles. But notice that this is a very sparse hypergraph because there are n choose two vertices and only n choose three edges. And the original standard triple system problem is really constructing a matching in this hypergraph, uh, a perfect, um, a, yeah, perfect matching, or I guess a perfect hypergraph matching. But now we have these higher order constraints. Not only are there these sparse triangles, you still need to make a matching, of course, but you have to avoid certain really strange configurations of, I guess, edges in, in that matching. Um, and, and it's really not obvious uh, what's happening here uh, in many, in many ways. Perhaps a more natural way of interpreting this um, is as follows. You can think of a j, j minus two configuration as a certain sub configuration. And we're basically trying to avoid all of these sub configurations. So we're just trying to construct a standard triple system that avoids a bunch of sub, sub configurations. But of course, in a standard triple system, you have to have triangles and you have to have stuff, you have to have stuff that looks like this because you just look at a vertex and you just look around it and you've got to have stuff like this. So you can't avoid every possible sub configuration, of course. And this JJ minus two is sort of pointing out the configurations that are not necessarily guaranteed to exist in the standard triple system. And so we just want to avoid everything that's not guaranteed in some sense. Um, and maybe as a comment, I should note that in general, j, j minus three configurations are actually appear all, all over the place in standard triple systems. Um, let me just show why that is. So what I can do is I can start with, let's say triangle and let's take a vertex and let's take an arbitrary edge coming out of it. This edge, since we're in a standard triple system needs to extend to a triangle. Okay, so now we have five vertices and two edges. So that's five, two. Now let's take another edge and let's extend it. So this is, this is, 
this is. So now we have 6, 3. Now let's take another edge and let's extend it. Now we have 7, 4, and so on and so forth. Um, at some point, some of these extensions could loop back into the original set, but that actually only makes it worse. It turns it from JJ minus 3 to JJ minus 4, which is even, even stronger in a sense because you can always just add an extra vertex. So if you just iterate this, then you can sort of guarantee lots and lots of these JJ minus 3 style configurations. I mean, of course, you can imagine there are some subtleties because if you have like a JJ minus three type thing, which contains something that's JJ minus two as a subset, then you can always just look at the subset and say, since I avoid that, I avoid the bigger thing. There are always these sorts of funny issues, but just as sort of a sweeping um, easy classification, you can say JJ minus twos aren't really guaranteed to exist, but JJ minus threes, at least some types of them are, are basically guaranteed to exist. So what we show um, is that Erdős's conjecture is true. So just to restate Erdős's conjecture, uh, for any fixed G, if you look at sufficiently large N, that is one or three mod six, then you have a standard triple system that doesn't have any of these configurations for J between four and G. Okay, so I should mention some prior work. This was only known for G up to six, and only G equals six is actually non trivial here um, because five three configurations um, or five, uh, uh, five three configurations contain four Q configurations. Um, so only G equals six is actually non trivial here. That was known through more explicit, like classical design theoretic, like Wilson style techniques. Um, and no standard triple systems at all for G at least nine were known to exist. So I think what was known is that G equals six for all values, G equals seven for like almost all values, G equals eight for an infinite family of values, something like that. And let me just illustrate what this actually means in the simplest case of G equals six, um, as it is a good illustrative example. So in G equals six, we're looking at a six, four configuration. And we know we're in a standard triple system, so we can already just look at sort of an edge disjoint 6-4 configuration. Um, turns out that the only thing that shows up is the following configuration, which is much easier to picture in 3D space, but I'll try to do it justice. So the triangles here are this, this, and this sort of outside thing. With the outside three things. So you can think of this as the, if you look at um, an octahedron and you color, you two color its faces, then you have sort of these two faces and these two faces. So this is what's called a patch configuration. And the simplest example, which actually was already known, is that there exist Steiner triple systems that avoid patch configuration. So sorry, this configuration is the only six four. The only six four, if you know you're uh, a linear hypergraph. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 So we're only looking at standard triple systems yeah, already. Sure, yeah. Sure, sure. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. 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 That, that's a good question. And, and that's sort of the reason why G equals five is trivial because five three configurations are not going to be linear. All right. Um, actually, are there any questions about the statement or, or what was known? Uh, I have a small one. Are there any lower bounds on N in terms of G? Oh, uh, uh, yes. Actually, I don't know if I mentioned explicitly in the slides. And Michael can chip in if I get it slightly wrong. So there's this result of, I think, Lineal and a couple others where they show that G has to be upper bounded by like log N over log log N or something. So okay. G cannot be ridiculously big. Um, and you basically do I this. I think it's uh, Lefman uh, Rettel Phelps. Oh, not, okay. not yeah, linear. yeah, it's not linear. You're, you're right. It's Lefman Rettel Phelps. Yeah, that, that's right. I'm um, sorry. There's, I was thinking of a different way. Um, yeah, and I think it's log n over log log n is what they get, something like that. So um, G can be at most 
log n over log log n. Yeah, so what they prove okay. is that in any standard triple system, mm -hmm. there is a jj minus two configuration where j is at most log n over log, or like c log n over log log n. Okay, so, so and, kind of yeah. turn, turning around, that means that if you give me some g, kind of the number of vertices that you need for your it's example will have to be at least six. Okay. Or, or, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, in terms of what we can actually prove, you have to look at the argument. We are very not careful. Yeah, sure. So we can certainly get like a power of log log um, and maybe a small power of log if you really cared. But um, it is, these sorts of things are often quite bad, of course. Sure. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Great. Yeah, that's a good question though. And that is actually interesting to understand although i feel like the upper bound is relatively close to what might actually be true and so it's probably pretty hard to actually do much better unfortunately um yeah um so one other prior result that needs to be mentioned um especially since we will use some of these ideas is uh, a result that was independently discovered by bowen and warnka as well as glock kuhn low and Ossis. um so actually erich's original conjecture that he also conjectured a weaker form where he just wanted almost all of the edges to be covered. Um, and with the techniques that were known at the time using like rotal nibble style stuff, um, people could only cover a small constant fraction of the edges where the small constant would actually get worse as G got bigger. Um, and Bowen Warnka and Glock Kuhn Lone Austin actually relatively recently uh, were the first to show that you can actually cover almost all the edges. And the way they do it is basically instead of running, um, you know, a rotal nibble or triangle removal process, um, you just run a similar process, but where you at every stage only choose from triangles where you can guarantee that there's no growth configuration that comes out of it. So literally the, the, the algorithm for this is you start with all triangles. At every step, you uniformly randomly choose a triangle, and then you update all of the possible, like, JJ minus two configurations um, based on that. And then you keep on going. And at every step, you have to ensure that you don't choose a triangle that you know completes one of these configurations, basically. It turns out that this pro process, process will run to completion. And that's the hard part. And that's what um, they independently show. So really, and this maybe harkens back to what was known in the original designs problems. Um, the task here is really completion in terms of getting these little of n squared um, remaining edges to be covered somehow. All right, so let's talk about iterative absorption, which is one way to cover this remainder. The other is, of course, Kibosh's method. Uh, perhaps I should just discuss it right now, um, since I don't have a specific slide for it. So um, the reason that we're going to attempt to use iterative absorption here to cover this remainder rather than kibosh is because when kibosh, the way kibosh covers this remainder in the original sort of designs approach is he has this original template that he puts in that comes from an algebraic construction. Then he does this nibble, and then he covers the remainder by sort of going backwards through the template and doing some sort of clique cascade where he flips on and off various configurations which were guaranteed to exist in the template. Okay, so why is that bad for us? Well, his config, like his actual template is literally going to consist of things that look like this and lots of other stuff in some algebraic way. Because what he's going to use is he's going to use these patch configurations that are guaranteed to exist in this algebraic template. And what you can notice is that this 6 4 configuration has sort of an opposite configuration. And so you can sort of flip between one and the other, depending on the situation, um, and potentially sort of absorb some extra edges that don't exist, stuff like that. Um, and so he sorts of needs to have these, this rich abundance of possible small girth configurations. I oh, should also mention that. This G that we're talking about is sometimes called the girth of the linear hypergraph. Um, yeah, up to like plus or minus two. Um, yeah, so he needs these small girth configurations to flip on and off. Now, 
if you think a little bit harder, you could ask, well, maybe you could secretly and cleverly construct some sort of algebraic template where the flips that you use are all high, like high enough girth flips. Like all the flips you use are girth G plus two and get it to work. But it turns out that with these linear algebraic constructions, there seem to be some fundamental difficulties getting past like G equals nine or something um, in terms of, it turns out that a lot of these algebraic situations, you're just guaranteed to have certain things because of rank configurations. It's not completely obvious what the situation here is, um, but it seems like um, it's not super amenable to, to general, the general situation. So with that in mind, um, I won't really talk about algebraic methods much anymore um, and focus more on iterative absorption. Um, so my primary goal is hopefully to let some people know about these beautiful ideas, um, which are uh, not my own, at least for the original or iterative absorption technique, um, because I think it does have a wide variety of potential applications, not just um, strictly for this problem. Uh, and hopefully you can learn something from that. And then also talk about um, why it doesn't immediately fly for the high grade situation and the sorts of things you really have to alter. All right. So iterative absorption on its own, um, you could say starts with absorption, of course. And you could say that this idea originates in a work of Erdős Kierkegaard and Piper, um, and perhaps was more systematized by Rodol Luchinsky and Sam Reddy. But there are various works uh, using this idea, of course. So I'm just going to talk about absorption within the context of this problem. So here's the idea. Let's say that somehow and magically we were able to cover every edge except for edges within a very small set that we can call X. Now, this is, of course, a very magical assumption, but let's just play with it for now. So we have this set X. And somehow, magically, we, knew, we know that we can cover everything outside of X. And X is the size M. M might be somewhat small within the original graph. The idea is, OK, maybe, maybe let's further assume we don't actually know what remainder is left over on X. We just know it's something. So if you think a bit, you'll realize that X will have to have even degrees and have to have number of edges divisible by 3 just because we started with a graph with that property and we just only removed triangles. Okay, so it's, it's a graph that a priori satisfies all the divisibility constraints you'd want. Now we want to decompose into triangles, but maybe a priori we don't know that X itself, like X is so small, maybe there aren't many edges left on it. So you, you don't really know much about it, right? It could just be some sort of like six cycle, which doesn't have a decomposition. So the idea of absorption here is to, at the beginning of time, plant something on top of X so that once we get to X, no matter what is left on X, we can somehow cover what we originally planted plus X. So we'll call this graph H that we originally planted. And the way we do this is, well, one way to do this, and this is actually done in this original work of clock kuhn lonasis essentially, is we look at every possible G that lives on X, and we just enumerate them. And for each G, we create a special graph that I'll call H sub G. And what we do is we sort of disjointly plant them all on top of X. And these H sub Gs have the property that H sub G on its own can be decomposed into triangles and H sub G along with a G on, on this X can also be decomposed into triangles. So, so these H Gs, they are not part of the original underlying graph or? Oh, well, yeah, they, they are. So you should, you should think of everything as happening inside of KN. Okay. And so at the so, beginning of time, we're just gonna take those guys out from KN. So how do you know that these guys can be disjoint? Yeah, so we'll, we'll get to that. Oh, okay, sorry, yeah, sorry. But no, no, okay. <laughs> no, it's a good question, it's a good question. Uh, glad you're engaged. Um, so the, the thing you need to ensure for now, let's say, is that H, like it contains X as a subset, but we don't want H to have any edges actually within X. We just want to H to sort of extend X. Um, so as you mentioned, why can you even find these within KN? Well, the reason 
unfortunately, is that you'd have to just have X be so small that um, there's enough space to just do it naively. So the number of graphs G that are possible on X are is of size around two to the M squared. And so to, in order to disjointly plant these things, you basically need something of size two to the M squared to, to do it, right? So, and since you need to be an original set of size M, that puts a constraint of M as being less than like C root log M for some small C. Right, okay. And it's not completely obvious why H sub G exists either for a given graph G, but it turns out that this is not so ridiculously hard to do. Uh, so, and in fact, we'll soon see uh, a nice way to do it. So, uh, all right. So that's not really good because I mean, there's no way like asking to decompose almost all of the graph except for a root log n size subset. So if you think about it, like if you could do that, then you could probably do the whole thing. Um, or worse than that, we're doing this thing where we have to take out these big absorbers, right? And so like, if we can decompose the graph minus those absorbers, it seems like there's, like this seems like a ridiculous ask a priori, right? Um, so here's the second idea, which is the iterative part, uh, which is really the hard part, um, is what we're going to do is we're going to, we want to cover every edge outside of X. Um, but in order to do that, we're gonna break this up into steps. And over time, we're going to basically shrink, shrink the vertex size under consideration one by one, um, not all at once, but rather at some rate. So we look at a decreasing sequence of vertex subsets where let's say each vertex set is eta fraction of the previous. So I'm just gonna index it by I because you might vary how fast it shrinks, I don't know. And at every step, what we're going to do, let's say at the first step, we look at V0, which is the whole graph. And we look at V1, which is some subset, eta subset. And we want to cover all, all remaining edges that are basically outside of V1. So in V0 choose two minus V1 choose two, everything that remains that needs to be covered in this region, we want to cover by triangles. And in doing so, we might have to use a couple of the edges inside of VI plus one, but hopefully that's fine. Um, and we continue the process. And then at the next stage, we're going to cover everything that's within VI plus one, but outside of VI plus two, and so on and so forth. And suppose further that we sort of originally set this thing up so that V sub L is of size little over root log n. And at the beginning of time, we plant these H's. And we, we could say just plant them in the in V0 minus V1. We could just plant them at the, in the original state phase, at which point hopefully it's not too hard to do things. Um, and hopefully that doesn't, those absorbers don't really change the picture. Then we're done. Because what you do is you first you set up this sequence of sets, um, which actually I could even try drawing. Um, so you set up the sequence of sets. We'll just draw three. Um, and we also have these absorbers, which we can say are sort of outside. And then what we do is we first cover everything out here, other than the red part, I guess. Then we cover everything out here and so on and so forth until we're left with just X. And then we have X plus the red part. And we chose the red part so that no matter what's left on X, you can cover X plus the red part. So then you would be done. Sorry, I'm, is, I'm still a bit confused. I'm sorry for the many yeah. questions, mm -hmm. but yeah, the way I understand now the red part, the edges are already covered. No, no, no. yeah. So, so what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take out the red part at the beginning of time, and I'm only going to cover the okay. remaining edges. Yeah, I see. Yeah. okay. Yeah, and since it's like going to be the amount of edges you're going to remove is like n to the one over a hundred or something if you choose the parameters right. So, in fact, in their their original, the way they originally stated, they make v sub l be literally a constant. And so their red part is literally a constant number of edges as well. So that's really not gonna affect these first arguments where we're gonna be running a randomized nibble process to begin with. Um, right. But yeah, uh, if you're going to use a rigid technique then it could pose a problem, but um, we can, it'll turn out that we can sort of, um, sort of ignore that. 
Okay, thanks. Yeah, good question, good question. So this idea two is really, really hard. Um, idea one, you could imagine sort of working out these explicit constructions, um, but idea two here is, is really hard. And sort of the key part of this work is realizing that you can actually make this happen. And as we'll see, this is not actually a trivial thing. Um, it has some difficulties with it. Then um, you can sort of think of this as being a cover down process. And uh, so I'm going to mostly be following this uh, later work of Barber, Glock, Kuhn, Lowe, Montgomery, and Ostis called Minimalist Designs, where they talk about basically finding triangle decompositions of almost complete graphs, where almost complete means that its minimum degree is at least, I don't know, let's say four fifths n or some, something like that, uh, for example. Um, and they're focused purely on the standard triple system case, which basically helps. Um, and so in, in that work, they call this the cover down lemma. Um, and this is, this is in some sense, the simplest case of a more general strategy, you could imagine, where the more general strategy would require, you know, more bigger like simplicity complexes and induction on scales and all this annoying other stuff. But here it's really a, a more simple thing, but still not at all obvious that you can make this work. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned, um, at step I, like we won't literally be able to, I, I sort of highlighted this blue stuff here. We won't literally be able to cover precisely VI choose two minus VI plus one choose two. Because I mean, if we could do something as precise as that, then we probably could already solve the original problem. And not only that, we also didn't make sure that the VIs are chosen in a way that VI choose two minus VI plus one choose two has like the correct divisibility properties. So that graph won't be able to be decomposed by triangles. Rather, what's gonna happen is that every stage, we're gonna decompose VI minus VI plus one, along with a couple edges in VI plus one, but it won't be too many edges in the smaller set. All right. Any further questions about this framework before we talk about um, an initial attempt to try to make this concrete? All right, so here's um, an attempt and attempt is sort of a signal that this is gonna be wrong, um, at least as written. So maybe try to think about that while I explain it. Um, so, okay, so now we can sort of simplify the situation. Let's just deal with a single step. So really we're just gonna be looking at VI and VI plus one. So I'm going to try to draw it like this. So here's VI, what I'm going to call VI star, and here's VI plus one. So VI is the union of these two sets, just to be clear. And so we need to cover, so we, we have something that maybe, let's say for now, is just the complete graph on VI, which is this whole thing, for now. I mean, in reality, it'll be like an almost complete graph or something, but let's just say it's a complete graph. And we want to cover with triangles, every edge that's outside of VI plus one. Okay, and maybe let's even say the whole set is a size N and this thing is a size eta N. That eta looks like the N. Okay, I'm just gonna say it's an eta fraction, okay. So here you can think of eta as being like 1%. Um, they actually take it to literally be something like 1%. Um, but you could think of eta as being like going to zero slowly, or in fact, later we're going to take eta to be n to the negative something. Turns out to be, what eta is precisely doesn't actually matter too much, but it's just a small fraction that we're trying to localize to. So we need to cover everything that's outside of the i plus one. So everything on the left, basically. So first let's consider all of the triangles that either use, so we have these edges, right? And we have these edges. So let's just look at the graph Let's just look at this graph basically. So every edge except for the ones in VI plus one. And let's consider that graph and let's consider all triangles in this graph and let's run a triangle removal process. So explicitly, we just take a uniformly random triangle and we remove it. And then we take the uniformly random triangle again, that doesn't intersect the previous one and we remove it and so on and so forth for a long amount of time. And we keep on running this until 
there are not many triangles left, or you can think of it as basically as long as we can reasonably control the process. And it turns out that the amount of time we can reasonably control the process is going to depend on this eta. Basically, because this eta signifies how irregular this original graph that we start at is. So the way we control these triangle removal processes in general is basically by showing it's roughly regular for some amount of time and looks, let's say, quasi-random. And so this eta is going to impact that. OK. So at the end of time, we can assume that there are f of eta fraction of edges remaining on the outside. And so if eta is going to 0, then this is little of n squared, which is a good start. Great. So now we just have little of n squared edges, basically, to, to cover. So the remaining edges, there are two types. There's this, there's this guy. There's this one. So OK, let's start with. Let's start with the one that's purely within VI star. What we're going to do is, OK, so here we're already going to say some, something that isn't really so great. But let's just hope that the remainder that we had has a lot of bipartite crossing edges for some reason. This is already a big ask, but let's just assume it for now. And what we're going to do is we're just, for each of these edges, we're just going to choose a uniformly random extension where both of these edges, these green edges, are also in the graph. And we're going to try to cover everything on the outside by doing this. OK, so not obvious that you can do that to begin with. So that's already one, one part. Um, but that's not even the worst part, actually, which we'll get to in a moment. So now we're left with these just these purely bipartite edges. All right. So now, since we only have bipartite edges, the way you can think of it is I have a vertex on this side, and it has no neighbors in VI star anymore. All of its neighbors that we need to care about covering are in VI plus one. And so this V induces basically some graph on this vertex at W, so V. And to cover all the edges touching V with triangles is the same, basically, as finding a matching of the graph WV. And we need to find a matching in every such WV simultaneously. And we need to do so in a way that all of the simultaneous matchings are all using different edges. So that none of the triangles at this stage at all touch. So it's a disjoint matching problem in some sense. Uh, so questions about that? Well, OK, so why, why doesn't this work? So the reason this doesn't work is that, as I mentioned, there's an f of eta fraction of edges left over. OK, so let's say, let's say for simplicity, OK, so okay, so how many bipartite edges are there then going to be heuristically? So heuristically, we're going to have eta f of eta bipartite edges, like that uh, times n squared, I guess. Um, and the reason is because, OK, we have one vertex here, which is eta n choices, and one vertex here, which is n choices. So that's eta n times n. And then there's this f of eta fraction. So this is sort of the amount of edges we have, eta f of eta. But the amount of edges that are purely within vi plus 1 is eta squared. And the last observation you need to notice is that, let's do this in blue, when we do this matching procedure, every, it, every two crossing edges corresponds to one internal edge, which means, uh, this is a little messy, sorry about that. We need this f of eta, this eta f of eta remainder, we need this to be less than this, the amount of edges in the next stage for there to be enough space to absorb it. And in fact, we want it to be much, much less, just so that we can say that the next stage still looks like a complete graph or, or whatever else, or a quasi-random graph, um, to, to get some control instead of having no control. Um, so we need this f of eta to be much smaller than eta for there to be space to run the strategy, just by space constraints. So the problem is that we cannot run the triangle removal process long enough. 
And so this seems to tank the strategy. And this is where some of the really nice ideas of iterative absorption come in uh, beyond this initial setup. Um, but are there any questions about this obstruction? All right. So let's talk about the actual cover down bump. So, okay. So again, you can think of eight as 1% if you want, or if you want, you can think of it as one over log n or n to the negative one over 100. It doesn't actually really matter. Um, and let's just say that, again, we have this bi star, which we have bi plus one. And let's just say that the total graph that we have here that remains to be covered is called GI, um, where GI is pseudo-random in an appropriate sense. Because in general, you'll need some more general statement. Um, and I'll just mention again that this particular version that um, I'm going to be talking about comes from this work of Barber, Glock, Kuhn, Lowe, Montgomery, and Osses, the way it's going to be stated here. All right. so. First of all, there was this issue where we didn't know that there were enough bipartite edges to cover everything on the outside. Um, so we're going to handle that issue by setting aside at the beginning of time a reserve graph R that's bipartite that's between these two parts. And what you can, the way you can do this is you can just, let's say, take an eta cubed sample of that, these crossing edges um, or something like that. Not so important exactly how you do it. And now we're going to try to cover everything that is outside of VI plus one and not in the reserve graph to start with. And so what we're going to do is on those edges, we're going to run the triangle removal process, but with a caveat, which is, again, if you did this naively, you'd have this F of eta problem. So what we're going to do is we're going to attempt to find a subset of triangles to run the triangle removal process on. We're not going to consider all triangles. We're going to find a special subset and only look within that subset ever. And we need to be regular in a certain way. Namely, that every edge is in roughly the same number of triangles. And it turns out that if you have that initial condition, it doesn't matter that the original graph doesn't really look exactly quasi-random, um, or it doesn't matter what those parameters look like, um, if we're off by eta or whatever else. Turns out that the only parameter that matters in some sense for how far you can run it is actually how regular it is in this sense, which is each edge has roughly the same number of triangles. And this is already known due to like work of alone and others, for example, um, um, more general like nibbles um, or processes that were known for a long time. But, but what wasn't really, I, I guess what, one of the novel things here is this idea that you can find this regular subset um, and use it as sort of a regularity boost in some sense. And so they call this regularity boosting. All right, and so what you do is you find a regular subset of triangles of this graph where each edge is in one plus or minus, let's say n to the negative one sixth or something triangles times t triangles for some t where this n to the negative one sixth here, again, is completely independent of eta. Eta, you can think of as a 1%. So this is so much better than eta that you can run the triangle removal process for much longer relative to eta. So now when we run the triangle removal process, the amount of leftover edges depends only on this parameter, as I mentioned. And so you can show that you're left with like n to the 1.99 edges or something. All right. On the other hand, at the start, we sort of guaranteed this eta cubed fraction of edges between these two things, which corresponds to, I guess, eta cubed times n times eta n edges in this reserve graph or so, um, let's say. And we also have this, like, uh, again, eta squared n squared edges in this final graph. All right, but we only have n to the 1.9 edges outside, which is so much less now. So we're in really good shape. So now we actually just run the ideas that I mentioned in the previous slide, but 
now we can actually successfully do it. So the first thing is for every edge that's purely outside, we do this thing where using the reserve graph, which is guaranteed to us to exist. So there's gonna be no problems there, basically. You can show that every one of these possible edges is gonna have many possible extensions. And so you can cover all of them disjointly actually, because there's so much space using disjoint extensions with both, both other edges in the reserve graph. Finally, once we do that, then we're left with these matching problems. And you can think of this matching problem as we have V here and we have W sub V. And what you think of W sub V as being is the neighbors of V are basically just the reserve graph neighbors minus a couple edges that were used to cover these purely outside edges and plus a couple of remainder edges that weren't covered yet. But this is like end of the 1.99 sort of thing. So for the most part, it looks almost purely as if you're just doing a matching problem in the neighborhood of V within the reserve graph, basically, with some minor edits. And we have a matching problem in this neighborhood. And I just mentioned originally GI was some sort of pseudo random or almost complete graph. And so this neighborhood W sub V is going to look pseudo random or almost complete itself um, in some appropriate sense. And so pseudo random graphs in general have matchings, um, sort of a well known thing. And so there should be an available match. And there's so few edges that need to be covered that we aren't going to be using many edges in VI plus one. And so it's very believable that you should even be able to get all these matchings simultaneously to be disjoint. One way you can do it is you can basically just go vertex by vertex and choose like a random matching um, at, at every stage. And you're just not going to ever really adversarially mess up any particular vertex's neighborhood. So there are a lot of ways to do this. Okay, so just briefly, why does this work? Um, as sort of the takeaways here. We managed to run the triangle removal process substantially further than before using this regularity boosting idea. And we also set aside this reserve graph to guarantee that we have these crossing edges and matching things are well controlled. All right. So are there any questions about this? Um, this basically, like with these elements, um, you could actually prove something like uh, an almost complete graph has a triangle decomposition which is already not completely obvious. Um, like you can even prove that a minimum degree 0.999N graph has some kind of decomposition, basically, um, if it you know satisfies degrees or even right number of edges of the like three. Um, and in, in fact, uh, if you read this paper of Barbara Glock, Kunlo, Montgomery Osses, the rest is basically filling in the details of the strategy that, that I just outlined. Now, of course, the the thing for higher designs you could plausibly believe follows some sort of similar lines, but you can imagine that it's much more complicated because like when I'm looking at a matching problem, for example, the analog, if I'm going to look at like a 4-3 system, the matching problem in the neighborhood is actually in and of itself a triangle decomposition problem. Um, and so you already need to be able to do the Steiner system stuff to be able to do this other thing. So you can imagine it's much more complicated. It really is a tour de force. Um, but I think a lot of the key ideas are actually contained here. All right. Now, um, for the, I guess, remaining time I have, um, I'm going to talk about the high girth aspect. So hopefully I've satisfied my promise that I would teach you all about iterative absorption and, and the beautiful ideas here. Um, and now we, uh, we'll talk about uh, the high girth problem um, and its specifics, and hopefully um, there are some interesting things here as well. Um, although I will warn you that some of these considerations will be a little more tactical now um, and based off of this iterative absorption framework. So let's just start with perhaps the simplest idea you could have, which is let's just try to modify iterative absorption to prove Erdős's higher conjecture. So the sort of obvious modification you can imagine is that at each stage, I'm just going to always choose from triangles that do not create a girth configuration. And okay, one reason why you could believe this works is that remember, I mentioned this result of Bowman and Worka, as well as Glock, Kuhn, Lowe, and Osses, where they actually did show that you could 
in the complete graph, let's say, cover all but little or one fraction of edges. So now you can imagine maybe you do that, but okay, you also have to adapt it to the setting where you have to do this like regularity boost or something, but you can imagine that you could do that um, and get it to work. So you could say, well, maybe you just do this. And for the matching problem, maybe there's enough space that you just also guarantee that you never hit a curve configuration. And then, okay, now I'm in a smaller set and a smaller set and so on and so forth. And maybe I just make the absorber at the end of time high girth in some way, and maybe it all works out. Okay, so let's, let's actually talk about this high girth triangle removal process because we're going to have to use it as a substitute. So it is true, and they did prove that it runs to near completion. Um, but it has this very curious property. So when I run the original triangle removal process, um, what happens is after, like when I'm at time one minus P, the remaining fraction of edges is like P and I have a P quasi random leftover graph in the triangle, the normal triangle removal process. And in this graph, if I am somehow going to need to decompose the leftovers and I want to know what sorts of triangles remain in this graph, I can actually see what, what they are. It's just a, basically a P cubed fraction of triangle um, of, or, or, or of original triangles, um, just corresponding to the triangles in this quasi random graph. And you could use any of them. But now, when we run this high girth triangle removal process, there's this funny thing that happens, um, which is if I'm left with like a P frac or a very small fraction of edges at the end of time, you could say, well, let's look at the triangles. So the remainder graph is still going to be a quasi-random graph, to be fair. So you have all those triangles. But some fraction of those triangles that exist in that quasi-random graph are going to be forbidden by the threats that are coming from the original part. Um, because you added in so many triangles that there's so many potential threats lying around. Um, and the magical thing about this JJ minus 2 is that it's perfectly balanced to be in kind of a Poissonian regime in a certain sense. And what that ends up implying is that a certain, like a certain fraction of triangles um, are now completely discarded, but a certain positive fraction of triangles are left over. And so we're in this perfect balance where for some Q, a one minus Q fraction of the viable triangles that are left over are completely forbidden and only a Q fraction are left over. Okay, so why might this pose an issue with iterative absorption? Because Every time I do this, I have this small set of VI plus one, but there are threats involving VI plus one that also use triangles from this original part or that use crossing triangles. And so this loss sort of carries over and intensifies. Um, and so we, we call this sort of just to talk about it, we called this constraint focusing. Because you can sort of think of as we focus on smaller and smaller subsets, we get this amplified effect. OK, so when we do iterative absorption, every time I start with a set of size n, and then I go to like a set of size 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%. So if I do this, I need to run around log n rounds. And so if I run log n rounds, and I'm losing q triangle, or I'm, I'm left with the q fraction triangles every time, at the end of time, the total fraction of triangles I'm going to left over in the in the best case, in the like here the independent heuristic, which is the best case, really, if you think about it, is going to be q to the power of l, which is a, a polynomially small fraction. Now, if my final set size is size like root log n and I have a polynomially small fraction of triangles, that means I literally have zero triangles. So there's there's no way I could work with anything at those steps of the cover down and get anything reasonable to happen. It's just not possible. So the, in order to do this, you'd need the final set of V sub L to be polynomial in size, not root log n in size. OK, so I should mention that you can improve this slightly because um, it turns out that you don't need to take 1% every time. The same proof that they have, you, you can actually take like n to the negative rho every time. And if you run this slightly more efficient, iteration strategy, uh, if you will, then you only need log log n rounds. Um, but q to the l here is still going to be poly logarithm. And so our final set size was size root log n, and this is a poly logarithm. So you're, you're still in some hot water here. So 
it's not completely obvious that you can you can make this work um, beyond other issues that are going to come up later. So are there any questions about this constraint focusing? All right. I mean, I should mention that Glock, Kuhn, Lovinos is already sort of in their one minus little one paper. They already noticed that this is sort of a, or this phenomenon more generally. Um, I'm sure they were thinking about this as well. Um, they don't explicitly say it. Um, it is really, it's really a hard thing to get around. Um, basically because in these original design problems, in all of these classical design problems, if I remove a bunch of triangles from some situation or I remove a bunch of like sets of size four or whatever, whatever it is from my design, and I have something left over, I can just focus on the leftover. I can just look, focus on the leftover and forget about everything that's ever happened and just keep on going. If I have two disjoint things, then I can just put them together. But now we have this issue that these, these JJ minus two configurations, these patch configurations, whatever they are, can cross over and cause these sort of pathological things to happen. Not even pathological, if you really think about it. Okay. so. So let's talk about the first step to getting around this constraint focusing issue, which is uh, a nice thing that we do, which um, is construction of efficient absorbers. So what we're going to do is remember originally we had the set of size M and we had a two to the M squared size thing that sort of absorbed it. We're gonna construct something which is polynomial in size. And that means that in fact, we can make the final set polynomial. All right. So here's, here's the basic idea. Um, let's take X. And all we know is that there's some mystery graph G that's on X and it has even degrees and it has triangles. So the idea is, or it has a, sorry, divisible Y3 number. Okay, so the idea is for every pair of vertices, I'm going to plant outside a bunch of vertices that just serve two paths. Let's say six x squared of numbers or something like that. And since x has even degrees, what I can do is let's just look inside x for a moment. I can decompose it into Euler tours, or so into basically cycles, uh, because of the Euler tour uh, theorem. So this is actually you could say the oldest theorem in graph theory, <laughs> and. Um, now what I do is, for every pair of vertices on the cycle, I can look at this. Uh, I can look at this outer vertex that I planted, and basically shortcut the cycle. So I had two of these things that I planted, and I can split this long cycle. It could be size x, and I can split into two smaller cycles, and I can keep on splitting into smaller and smaller and smaller cycles, using these extra things that I planted. And in this way, we can actually decompose the mystery graph plus this thing. The mystery graph could even be the empty graph whatever it is, the mystery graph plus this thing can be decomposed into a bunch of bounded length cycles. In fact, you can make it cycles of length three, four, or five. And now what we can do is we can say for every possible, you know, for every possible, okay, um, for every possible bounded length cycle that we have, Okay, so a cycle of length four does not satisfy the obvious divisibility constraints that we need. But if you group a cycle of length four with a cycle of length five, it does. And so if I take some copy of a disjoint C5 and a C4, there's going to be some special G that I can put on top of it to extend it, to absorb it, just because of the strategy that we had before. It'll be some specific finite graph that I can plant on top of it. So for every possible like C4 and C5 anywhere in the graph, or maybe even the share vertex or whatever else, every possible configuration. There are only finitely many of these types of graphs because they're bounded size cycles. What we can do is on every possible place that they could exist in this bigger thing, we just plant a disjoint absorber on top of all of those. And there are only polynomially many copies that could exist. And so this is gonna be a polynomial size construction. Right, but th that's the whole proof basically. Um, and okay, there's this issue where you also want this to be high girth. So you want the triangle decomposition you get at the end of time from this absorber to be high girth. Turns out there's a very simple gadget that you can sort of attach on top of any absorber system 
um, and get it to be high growth for free. I don't really want to talk about it more, uh, but basically some sort of long cycle in some sense, um, which we call a G sphere because it looks kind of like, I think you basically take a sphere with its poles and you sort of take a cycle around it and you do some sort of alternation. Anyways, let's just take out my faith that you can make it high growth and we can actually make this polynomial as absorber, which is great. That means that we can take the final set to be polynomial in size without messing up the original graph. And in fact, it's, it's even better than that because since we said from every step, I could go from n to like n to the 0.99999 or something, that means we only need O of one rounds to get from a set of size n to a set of size n to the one over 100. Um, and, and it turns out that this row that we can take will depend on G because of the dependence on the high growth process. Um, so it's really O sub G of one rounds, but it does depend on G. Okay, so it seems like we're in really good shape. Polynomial size final set, O of one rounds, what could go wrong? Well, okay, so, so, so it turns out that something can still go wrong. Um, this you could argue is even one of the harder aspects of constraint focusing, although it's not immediately obvious to a first glance. That's why I deferred it until now. But this is actually almost in some sense a, a, a quite annoying constraint to get over, which is that um, every time I run a round of the high growth process and I hopefully run a step of this iterative absorption plus high growth, I'm going to have a Q fraction of triangles left over at the next stage. Then I run it again within this, within this set of triangles. And then I do it again and again and again and again. And there's actually this issue, which is as the density of remaining triangles gets smaller and smaller, like from 1% to 0.001% and so on and so forth, the extent to which you can control this high growth removal process actually gets, gets worse. Um, like the, the exponent that you can run to actually gets worse. Um, and you can actually sort of show that this isn't, this isn't purely an artifact, um, as it turns out. There's some annoying issues that, that do generally show up. Um, OK. And that, if at every step the row that you can get gets worse, then the number of rounds that you would need then gets even bigger and bigger and bigger. And so you get into this sort of divergent situation where you can't actually get much farther than like some fixed number. So, so that's an issue. So the idea is that we run an initial sparsification. And actually, let me just, again, Take out my trusty diagram. So one sort of reason you can see why maybe this is doing something that's worse than what you'd expect in general is that we're decomposing this entire outside, right? Basically, and focusing all the constraints on this completely untouched, pristine subset, right? So now that subset looks like a complete graph still. So it has all of its own internal threats and issues, but it also has all this external stuff that's coming onto it, basically. And that's why we're getting this Q to Q squared, so on and so forth effect, basically. And then when you do this, it gets worse and worse. So the idea is, let's try to get, and this is really coming from the Poissonian behavior of JJ minus two configuration. Because you can convince yourself that if you like sample triangles randomly at density one over N, which corresponds roughly to the regime that we're in for standard triple systems, you can sort of convince yourself that you have on every triple of vertices, you have like a Poisson number of, extensions that would complete like, let's say a 6-4 a configuration. And that's what's really causing a problem here. The idea is try to get rid of the entire contribution from the Poissonian heuristic at the start, and then hopefully never have to deal with it again. And the way we run, the way we do this is by initially sparsifying the graph and then running iterative absorption only on the sparse room index. And it turns out that when you run iterative absorption with this high growth triangle removal process on a sparse remainder, it turns out that you don't get this constraint focusing issue anymore. Although that's not completely obvious to convince yourself of, although there are good reasons for this to be the case. The idea is that like realistically in a typical actual high growth standard triple system, every triangle is just gonna look like it came from some initial nibble, whether it's like bad or good in some sense, or whether it has like extensions to, you know, annoying configurations, should just look like it came from an initial single nibble. 
not multiple like tiered nibbles that are focusing on each other. Um, that's sort of an artifact of the way that error resorption focuses in on itself. So we want to remove that focusing effect from the actual heuristic that really should exist. Um, so the idea is we, at the beginning of time, we run the high growth nibble for some fraction of time until we are left with around like n to the 0.001 fraction of edges left over, some p fraction of edges left over. And now we have some quasi-random graph to work with. And then we run this high growth iterative resorption on this remaining quasi-random sparse graph where there's a q fraction of triangles left over. And when you do it in this way, it turns out that, as I mentioned, um, any further steps, since we're in this p sparse graph, are not going to supremely focus threats. All right, are there any questions about the approaches that we take to get around this constraint focusing? I should just mention that this is really one of the key issues here, because as, as mentioned, you can't just shove together two triangle configurations and expect them to work out. And so this is really one of the big issues. We have to do this efficient absorption um, combined with a sparsification. And I, I should actually mention that the only reason we can actually do iterative absorption on such a sparse graph is because of this efficient absorber. Um, so actually in these original papers of Block, Kuhn, Lowe, and Ossis, um, unlike the Kiwash results, they cannot get um, a counting result for the number standard triple systems. Um, the reason is because their quantitative dependencies aren't good enough because they can't, um, they, they, they basically can't do the sort of p sparsification um, to a polynomial degree. Um, but because of this efficient absorption thing, you actually can now make it, uh, make it work. Although, of course, using Kiwash's method, you could already count, you know, standard triple systems or whatever else. But it's nice to know that this more combinatorial technique in and of itself can also suffice. All right. Uh, let's just talk about a couple of other things um, that come up in terms of issues. So one thing is, remember that we had this regularity boosting strategy for the nibble or for the, I guess, uh, triangle removal process in the original iterative absorption framework. And we still, of course, will need something like that on the set of triangles we work with. But there's also this funny issue, which is um, that the threats could become weirdly irregular over time. Because over time, what we're going to do is when we restrict to a certain set, let's say the set is B sub I, and we've already done everything beforehand. Everything from all the prior times in history are going to induce some sort of partial threats on the remainder within V sub i that we need to work with. And there are going to be some sorts of partial air dish configurations, I guess. So air dish configuration just means a minimal j, j minus 2 configuration. Um, and it turns out that we need to know, in order to be able to run this high growth process for a long amount of time, we need to know that every triangle is contained in roughly the same number of, of threats of any given size. Um, and so the idea here um, is not super difficult. We just throw in a bunch of bogus threats <laughs> just, to, just to make it regular and then move on with our lives. Because if we're avoiding more threats, that's, not, that's only better for us. Um, so, okay, so I, um, the, way, the, way we, um, the, the way we think about it is think of every possible triangle as a vertex in a hypergraph and every threat that we already have as some J tuple of these triangles. So it's a J uniform hypergraph on these triangles as vertex. And we want to basically regularize the degree, single vertex degree of it, this hypergraph by adding in J tuples. And we're actually just going to add in things that look like they're threats, but they're really just random, like, or almost random J tuples of arbitrary, dis like, disjoint triangles. Like they don't actually even look like anything you'd actually care about forbidding, but we're just going to add a couple of these in random places just to make it regularized. All right, so 
I'm just going to state a version, which you could do if you're looking at size two threats. Um, but the, there's a natural hypergraph generalization, which is what we need in general. All right. Sorry about that. All right. So let's consider n vertex graphs, where n here is misleadingly now you could think of as the number of triangles so okay well, let's just think about graphs and, and forget about that so we have two graphs uh, and we have h and we have g and i'm just gonna write up the whole thing now and so what we want to do is we have g that we're given and we basically want to somehow regularize the, the degrees of g Okay, so we want to add in some edges, basically. And since we already have some existing threats that we are not allowed to, or we don't really want to add in because we don't, for various reasons, maybe there are, and for various other reasons, maybe there are some forbidden edges that we aren't allowed to add in. So you have some G that we want to regularize, and we have some H, which are edges that we aren't allowed to add in. And, but we want to add in some stuff in the complement of H and hopefully regularize the degree of G. And so, what we show is that um, you can do this, in, in, in fact, in a very random way. So what you can do is you can actually just p sample edges, where p is 8d over n, where d is the maximum degree of the original graph. And you can find a subgraph of that with high probability, such that the, the number of edges you add to g isn't too much. So its maximum degree doesn't increase by too much. But now, all of the vertex degrees are super regular. In fact, they're all within log squared of each other. In fact, you can get down to like around log n if you really care. And the proof of this isn't super complicated. Um, the idea is basically you take the graph G that you have and you look at all the vertices and you look at all the edges coming up from vertices and you assign each of these edges some weight, basically. And you, you add each edge with certain probabilities, basically. Um, where the weights depend on the degrees of the vertices. And you do this in a way such that you expect that the degree discrepancy is going to go down. So, something like this, basically, um, is the idea here. And you can imagine that something more general could work for hypergraphs. All right. Are there any questions about this? This is more of a general purpose thing that might be of more general interest, um, but this is the sort of thing that we need to, to regularize the process more generally beyond this finding the special triangle subset. All right. So there's one sort of final thing I want to talk about in terms of um, how we prove this result. Um, if you put together all the elements that I've talked about so far, I think you can sort of get a, a rough sketch of what's going on, but there's actually some strange technical issues that come up that I'm gonna try to describe. Um, and what we do is we, we introduce some ideas, um, building on some ideas of Bowman and Warnka to, that get around a lot of otherwise very, very sort of ridiculously complex combinatorial situations, um, at least in my view. Um, maybe these ideas might be, might be a benefit in a more general situation. All right, so, and this is something that we call retrospective analysis of the random process um, that, that we're using. So, so in fact, I want you to note that this iterative absorption process is really a random process or random algorithm, randomized algorithm for constructing a standard triple system. Um, because at every step, you're just doing some sort of triangle removal process um, on something where you, okay, you remove some reserve graph randomly, and then you did some stuff, and then you find some matching. So you can imagine this is purely al algorithmic, really. Um, and it, so it's really a random process. So at every step of the cover down lemma, you need to, and even in the proof without the high grade situation, we didn't really say much about what you actually prove at every step in order to maintain some sort of guarantees so that you can go from step to step to step without everything just completely blowing up. So for just Steiner triple systems, what you do is um, at every stage, you notice that the graph G sub I that you have on V sub I is I guess in, in their approach, they need it to be a dense quasi-random graph, basically, something like that, for example, um, or a, an almost complete graph, let's say. 
And so if I know that GI is in some quantitative sense, then pseudo random, then with enough massaging, you can imagine, and for an appropriate notion of pseudo random, which is generally something like typicality, which is that like every triple or quadruple of vertices has the right number of neighbors, um, something like that. And you, you can actually show that you can run all these heuristics appropriately. You can run all these processes in a way that you'd expect. Because that's all you really are using about the, the quasi-randomness of, of that sort of stage in order to make everything work out, these relatively local properties. All right. And that actually alone is going to be sufficient for this algorithm for constructing a sign or triple system to succeed with high probability. Now for us, there are a lot of weird issues that are gonna happen. Like at step I, I need to know what all of the possible threats that are induced by all of the previous things ever are gonna be. We need to know all of them. So we need to understand all sorts of weird distributions of collections of strange subsets of triangles, subsets of these JJ minus two configurations that are in the graph that come from all prior cover down stages and how they affect the current state. And I mean, if you've ever tried to prove something even about like, you know, looking at copies of H in a random graph or something where H is some arbitrary graph, there are already like weird combinatorial considerations that come up. Like you, you need to make sure H is strictly balanced. Sometimes you need to do all sorts of weird stuff. Um, and it's not really clear, especially in the hypergraph situation, we're looking at these completely arbitrary JG minus two configurations, basically. We're looking at subsets of them potentially because they're gonna be induced from previous stages. And then I'm gonna induce things over multiple stages. So I'm gonna induce something, I'm gonna induce it again, and I'm gonna induce it again, and so on and so forth. You can imagine there are all sorts of complex considerations that come up and you'd need to do some sort of ridiculous large amount of control. So in some sense, you could say naively, you'd have to track the distribution of configurations that span every possible, you know, across all possible stages, all possible configurations with a random variable for each one of these, and you need to show some sort of concentration for each of these at every step. And you need to show this sort of self closes over time and gets maintained. And this seems very daunting, even for a very simple case like g equals six. And some of the naive statistics that you might write down don't concentrate exactly how you'd want them to. Um, so it's not completely obvious how, how you'd actually do this. Um, I think it is in theory possible for like a fixed G if you write down all the right things and you say something or you do some sort of various multi-scale analyses and, and various other things that are very, I think, complicated for like a given G, maybe I could write it out. But I, I, it's not clear how to do it for general G certainly. And uh, to be honest, it's not completely clear to me that you can actually do it. I, I, I believe that you should be able to do it though, to be fair. Um, so I, I'm not gonna claim that um, this is what we introduced is purely strictly speaking necessary, but it, I, I think it certainly is a nice thing, um, this retrospective analysis idea. And so Bowman and Morka have some similar ideas in their um, proof of this, this analysis of this higher process, because uh, they also have to deal with some complex configurations, um, albeit only in one stage. And, they have some nice ideas and, and we build on these. Um, and basically what they note is that if I have, well, let's just look at the first, the first step where we do genuinely just run this higher removal process, this initial specification on case of n, and we just run the process. Then the probability that any given triangle is in this thing is around one over n, just because there are gonna be around n squared triangles and their n cubed total at her, her possibilities. And it turns out that you can actually say that because this process is so random, that if I give you K triangles where K is like a hundred, the probability they're all gonna be simultaneously chosen is one over N to the K. And if I know that, then that allows me to control constant sized moments of various statistics that you might run into. Like if you think about it, if I want to control the number of triangles in G and one half, for example, this is a completely unrelated, just as an example, I want to control the number of triangles in G and one half. Um, 
of course, I can do it by the second moment method, right? Um, but to, to do the second moment method, or if I just want like an upper tail bound or something, whatever it is, let's say, um, I only really need to know, I, need, I just need control over the finite sized moments of what various edges in GM one half are like. And so I don't actually need to be in a purely independent model. I just need to be in like a KYs independent model or, or, or something like that. And for us, we're only gonna be really focusing on like controlling sizes and tails for the most part. And so it turns out that we actually basically just need to understand the order of magnitude of these bounded size moments. And so the idea is that at every step, because everything is purely random from here to here to here to here, at every stage, we're doing something that's basically purely random, I'm uniformly randomly choosing a triangle from the high growth process, or I'm uniformly randomly choosing some matching or whatever else it is. So at every step, you can imagine that like, if I'm in G sub I, then I have a very precise prediction, which is namely that every triangle occurs with probability one over V sub I. Or maybe something slightly altered because we had some sparsification, other stuff going on in the background. But naively, you can imagine something like that. And so if I have some finite collection of triangles spanning various stages of a process, there's a very concrete prediction that you can actually prove because every further step is random conditional on the previous one for what the probability that all these triangles are in simultaneously is. It's just a product of those heuristics, basically. And so we can control at the right scale at every stage, these constant sized moments. And so at every point in time, let's say I'm now looking at stage I and I want to understand, and let's say I'm trying to do something at stage I, like I'm trying to, I'm trying to run the high growth process, or I'm trying to show that I have enough space to run my matching in a way that like is high growth simultaneously and nothing's going wrong. At that point in time, I can look at all of the randomness retrospectively of the process that has ever happened up until now and just treat it all as one chunk of randomness and use a moment method, a moment estimate, similar to like Kim Wu polynomial concentration, those sorts of ideas to show that certain things that we need to be small at this stage are in fact small. There aren't too many threats, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, using tail bounds from these high moments. And then say, okay, now I can run this step. And I run this step in a random fashion. Then for the next step, I look at all of the randomness again, and I keep on going. And this is, it turns out much, much simpler compared to, I guess the naive approach would be at every stage, I do some random amount of stuff. And then I put, I write down like a list of a trillion guarantees on the current configuration of graph, remainder, threats, blah, 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 blah. And you have all this stuff and you write down a list of a trillion conditions. And based on also the configurations, all the complicated things that can happen with those of size up to G. And then you would naively try to evolve this from one step to the next step to the next step to the next step and hope that none of the guarantees mess up. Instead, we can bypass all of that by using this idea of retrospective analysis. And so that, that's why I think that this is a very nice idea that could be applied in many other situations where you have some sort of random process and um, it's broken up into natural stages and maybe you don't always need to do this thing where like from one stage to the next, you have to control it step by step, but maybe there's there's a sense in which you can control every step um, on its own retrospectively. And so Bowman work actually takes this almost in some sense a step further. So here we're really using this like, okay, each of our steps here is like high growth process or matching or cover the leftover edges or blah, 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 blah. And we have these very discrete steps, but actually Bowman Warka even use it for the triangle removal process itself. So they have, they basically do this sort of technique n squared different times um, throughout a random process in some sense and get it to work. And so this is actually, I think, quite a general idea phenomenon, which um, could be of independent interest as well. So this allows us to get around a lot of the otherwise very, very, very annoying combinatorial considerations that might show up. Although admittedly, we still do need to see a lot of considerations and make sure we're actually capturing the truth at every stage and, and, and stuff like that, of course. Um, but fortunately, it does uh, seem to all work out. And uh, one sort of nice way that we capture um, these observations about the expected size of these moments is um, we, we think of these things as sort of weight systems, where um, you can imagine that 
I have this random system of triangles. And in some sense, it's dominated by a weight system, which is like, you can imagine that each triangle comes with a given weight. And the moment that I get is going to be bounded by like the product of the corresponding weights um, in some sense, which you could really think of it in some sense being coupled to um, be a subset of some sort of independent model, um, if you think about it like that, um, but, but not quite. Um, so, so yeah. Are there any questions about this retrospective analysis? All right. So I think it's basically been 90 minutes, which is perfect because I'm done. So uh, you can find our full paper online. Um, it, 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 of course, includes all of the technical details that I uh, neglected to mention. Um, and I'd actually recommend, if you're interested in iterative absorption more broadly, to actually check out this paper by Barber Glock. Alo, uh, Kuhn, Montgomery, Ossus, uh, because with what I've told you here, you could actually read through it and, um, and sort of see where all these pieces come together. It's really a nice result in and of itself. I think it has a lot of nice ideas that can be used going further for, for the result. Hopefully you learned some stuff from these other parts as well. All right, uh, so that's all I have to say. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them. All right, thank you very much, Ashwin. Are there any questions? So I have a, a really small and pretty vague one, but like these uh, efficient absorbers mm -hmm. that you have, like how general are they? Like, are they very specific to that Steiner triple problem or could this yeah. idea in theory improve some other results where absorbers were used? Yeah, so I think it's relatively like this particular, like. This particular thing is relatively specific to mm -hmm. the design situation. So, um, it okay. So it turns out you don't even need to use Euler tours. Um, there are actually some funny tricks that you can do. So it turns out that you can find polynomial absorbers for a general like designs problem. Okay. Um, although the way I I don't know how to do it explicitly, um, but you can basically use the results of like the the Kivash result to actually get it for free in a sense which is a little, it's a little roundabout and strange. Um, I don't really want to get into it, but it turns out that they do exist. Um, and there is, there are definitely lines of work where, um, let me just find the slide. There are definitely lines of work where efficient absorbers are important. Um, so for example, for counting designs, of course, you need something sort of efficient to, to count it. And so for this, for these higher designs with just the counting, with just uh, this iterative absorption approach, you a priori can't do it unless you have um, a polynomial absorber. And unfortunately, the only way I know how to explicit, I imagine you could probably use some sorts of ideas like we have here, maybe get something to work. The only way I actually know how to do it is to cite the result. Um, oh, okay, actually you can cite, you can cite iterative absorption itself, I think, and get it to work. This is some like super terrible thing, but like you need it for counting type things. And there is a whole line of work of basically using like complicated theorems to show that efficient absorbers in certain contexts actually do exist, okay. which is interesting. So for example, you can use iterative absorption itself to show that these things exist, funnily enough, um, or, or various other things. Um, so for example, there's this work of, um, I think it's Montgomery where he shows that like, if I take like some sort of construction where I basically take like a hundred random matches on top of each other and duplicate them in various ways, you can get like um, some sort of like bipartite subset where no matter which like n vertices I delete on this side, I can find a perfect matching between these two other sides mm -hmm. or, or something like that. And that can be used in like for absorbers and matching problems. And you know, you actually have to do a non-trivial calculus. You have to do a non-trivial thing to actually get this absorber. And the point is that it has some efficiency because if I wanted to a priori like delete any possible subset of size n, if you did some, some, some sort of naive disjointness thing, you'd have two to the n possibilities. But he's doing this really efficiently by proving some sort of combinatorial theorem. Um, and, and really, I guess, using Hall in his case. Um, and, and actually, for, for example, that absorber that he uses is actually um, built upon and used within um, a result of my co-author, Matthew Kwan, where he shows that almost all, like with probably one minus little one, our uniformly random standard triple system has um, has a perfect matching in it. So you can find a subset of n over three triangles, which cover the vertices. And he actually needs to use this like very non-trivial Montgomery construction and, and further 
further amplify. And so there are definitely um, lines of work where people are interested in absorbers where they're efficient in some sense, where you're getting some sort of entropy gain. So in our case, what we did was instead of saying, oh, you have to look at every possible graph you know, separately, we basically sort of decomposed the graphs into ways that saved information. So in our sense, we sort of reduced the situation so that you only had to look at bounded size components. And then there are only polynomial many possible bounded size components to work with. And so you can just plant something on top of every one of those instead of you know, having this initial two to the m squared issue. And so there are definitely a lot of, I think, ways in which beyond like sort of naive where you just have some very specific configuration you flip on and off. I think people are starting to find ways in which you can use absorbers um, in more efficient and more sort of unique ways. Um, I, I don't have like a, I don't know, like this particular Euler tour thing, I, I don't think like directly applies to something else or anything like that. But I think there's definitely a lot of work um, in these sorts of areas, for sure. Cool, very interesting, thanks. Are there any other questions? Me. I'm sorry, yeah. Also, if Michael has anything to say about that. He, he knows some of this literature nice. as well. No, I think you've uh, given a, a, a good answer. <laughs> Okay, so are there any other questions? That doesn't seem to be the case. So thanks again, Ashwin, for the great talk. I, whoops. <laughs>